what I want to present to you today is basically a work in progress um, that uh, the person to which I, I which I will focus in this brief talk, I prepared a longer um, presentation, so I will have to cut some parts. Uh, is Girolamo Fracastoro is a Renaissance poet, a philosopher, scientist, like many Renaissance people. Uh, he was a man of uh, multiple interests. And I'm writing a book about his theory of uh, poetry as a way to communicate and disseminate science. And specifically here, I will also uh, study one aspect that is related to, uh, given the, the topic of uh, your conference, uh, with the theological aspects. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the, this is a work in progress about this uh, um, conception of uh, um, Fracastoro, uh, the idea that uh, he wrote uh, several poems on the with a scientific content. And what I would want to present to you today is uh, a general conception of what uh, is view, what is uh, poetry as a way to communicate science and specifically the theological aspect of science, because as you will see for Fracastoro, the understanding of science as nature is based on a knowledge of God. And as I said, I had to, um, to shorten a little the presentation due to time constraints. So, um, and for the same reason, I will not read the entire uh, end out. And if you are interested, I can send it to you. Uh, I start by the um, fact that uh, it also raises a methodological problem that uh, Fracastoro died in the uh, 1515, uh, and uh, he published after his death, uh, uh, sorry, not he, was published after his death, several dialogues. Uh, among them, there is uh, this very interesting one called the Naugerius. And uh, this is a dialogue, so it's very difficult to see how much is uh, can be attributed to Fracastoro and what instead can be uh, attributed to his characters. And so, uh, but I have, I unfortunately, I cannot dwell on this problem here. What, however, is clear is that for uh, Fracastoro, the there is a complex relationship between poetry and the sciences. In the first passage that uh, you see here, Fracastoro basically argues that uh, the, um, the every science has a particularly particular body of rules and uh, methods and so on. And among these sciences, uh, he actually mentions the science of God and so theology. And in these respects, the poet is not a teacher of these subjects. Uh, the, the poet, on the contrary, as you see at the end of the passage, borrows from them, from these sciences. However, in later in during the, dia the dialogue, uh, it's introduced then why uh, one should uh, instead communicate the sciences through poetry if we agreed that the poet has nothing to teach in the subject themselves. And the Fracastore introduces this idea that uh, the, uh, the poetry, and specifically the poet, uh, is, does not uh, um, does learn from the sciences, but on the other hand, uh, gives something back to the sciences because it presents these sciences in a very clear language, in a very beautiful one, and so it presents not just the contents of the sciences, but also its intrinsic beauty and its, uh, so to say, it exposes it into a very detailed and clear way. Um, of course, there is a limit about how much poetry can communicate uh, these sciences in a, another work, which I will focus better in the uh, later part of the presentation that uh, it's a dialogue uh, this time about the soul. And uh, during the discussion, uh, it is introduced the uh, theological doctrine of the soul of the world. 
And there, there is a quotation you see here uh, on the from uh, Virgil's uh, Aeneid about the motion of the stars. And uh, the uh, participant of the, the dialogue, which is uh, this time here, is a fracastor himself who is speaking in the dialogue as a speaker, while in the now Jerius uh, is a friend of Fracastorus that is speaking. So you see how complicated it is to see how much uh, what belongs to another character can be traced back to Fracastoro. But here, in any case, once uh, after Fracastoro quotes Virgil and he says that this is great, but our theologians have written about this more precisely and accurately. So you see that uh, there is a limit about how much you can convey on this, but still the poet has an essential utility because it presents uh, the beauty of the science itself. And so it has an aesthetic role, which is actually also an epistemic role, because if you present the beauties and the uh, of the subject and uh, with a clear language, you actually communicate this science better. Um, I skip maybe this one and move actually very briefly on this because this actually will be a uh, um, content of a separate talk because I mentioned to you that uh, why I'm presenting this in a conference about uh, uh, superstition and the theology and faith, all these things. Well, because as I mentioned before, actually the uh, view of uh, Fracastoro is uh, strongly based on a theological conception. Uh, the poet themselves is, uh, and this actually borrows from Plato's uh, Yon in the uh, dialogue uh, where Socrates speaks with a rhapsode or a one who was used to uh, professionally perform the Homeric poems. And uh, he tries to understand why, without knowing anything about uh, the subject of which uh, uh, the rhapsode is performing, he still does in a very catchy and beautiful way. And here he introduces the idea that the poet is divinely inspired. Uh, Fracastoro continues this platonic line for the sake that the poet uh, is uh, possessed by the divine and so he can, uh, this is why he can uh, also communicate in a very clear and be beautiful language, although of course there are differences on this because for instance the poet of Plato has no knowledge of science while we have seen that for Fracastoro you, uh, the, the poet has to learn sciences in order to communicate them. Uh, and there are also many other differences, but what is clear, the continuity, is that the poet is something divine, and that this divinity of the poem is what allows him to um, grasp the beauty of a scientific subject. Not only that, but if you uh, read, return again for a second to the dialogue on soul, where Fracastor at the end presents a summary of his cosmological views, when he speaks about the generation of the universe and the cosmos, he says that originally there was God who created the two primary substances, the hot and the cold. And what you see here is better to check on the Latin, that he says that these substances were pulcra et formata. So, in this sense, uh, there is an intrinsic beauty of the universe that is based on God as a principle, not only of order and understanding, but also of, uh, uh, of beauty. And, and this is why, again, there is a connection. The poet, in, uh, possessed by God, can perceive the beauty because uh, he, so to say, is revealing an intrinsic beauty in the uh, universe itself. I fear that for time limit, I have to skip the third part, which actually there is also uh, not to exaggerate the references to the divine in Fracastoro's uh, poetry, because sometimes uh, the gods, the references to the gods are, as in the Naugelius says, sometimes the poets, especially the ancient ones, um, refer to divinities and gods because they wanted to give a sublimity and wonder to their discourse, but this does not commit 
to the theological representation of what is there. This also explains why in uh, this I finally started to mentioning the concrete poems by Fracastoro. The most famous one that you probably heard about it is the Syphilis, a poem about the axiology and uh, symptomatology and therapy of syphilis. And here you find the numerous references to the polytheistic gods of the pagan traditions. But uh, as I was saying, these are, so to say, uh, artifices or references to embellish and make the beautiful discourse. Fracastoro does not really believe that there are numerous gods of which the pagan tradition uh, refer to his view is was a Christian. This I didn't mention before, but probably you grasp uh, intuitively when I mentioned that passage of the creation from nothing. So he's committed to this idea of uh, the Christian God as the source of creation and actually also of predestination and grace. But this will be a total different topic. And so I just open the reference and close it immediately. I come to the conclusion because, uh, you know, it's, a, again, I, I could say more, but I wanted to also hear your ideas on this. And actually, if you ever happen to see this nexus between poetry, science, and theology before and after Fracastoros, I will be very interested to know about it. But I, as I um, uh, will say that when I was introduced, I want actually to refer a, a a work of Fracastoro, who again, this was unfinished, is a poem about Joseph, of uh, the tale about the Genesis, Joseph and his brothers, and so he tries um, um, his uh, banishment from the family, and then his uh, meeting with the Pharaoh, all things that you know well, and so I don't have to uh, say much more, but what I would like to, um, to do here is actually to present briefly a case study that uh, uh, Fracastoro, not only in works dedicated to sciences, but actually also to poetic works that seems not to be dedicated to sciences, actually have a scientific content that he tries to disseminate and express in beautiful form. And the, the case study that I want to show you is the dream theory that is uh, connected, as is presented in the, the poem Yosef. But before that, I have to make a step back and return once again to uh, the dialogues of Fracastoro, this time introducing a third dialogue that I did not mention, which is the Turius or, the, or, or the, on the intellect. And this is dedicated to what we will call today epistemology. And among the things that Fracastoro discusses is the dream, and specifically also the why there are some prophetic dreams that people have. Um, the premise of Fracastoro's dream the uh, theory is that actually when we say the mind is sleeping, it's one will will say the mind is not active. So you say it's just a work of imagination. Instead, Fracastoro says that when the mind or the soul is sleeping, actually the, the intellect is still continuing to work, but in a confused and difficult manner, but still is working. You see that, the, for instance, you have in the Latin references to intelligent, to subnoxiones, these are cognitive activities. And so when he wants to explain how people can uh, apparently uh, foretell future events, he actually says, and here I prefer to quote the passages that they say, these phenomena would have been in themselves the result of reasoning and of a logical process. Because these such circumstances that actually occurred were certainly a matter of chance, but on the other end, they actually also uh, impart the results of reasoning. So to say, if one foretells a future events, it is because the mind is reflecting on the images that is stored in his memories. He makes, a, so to say, a reasoning about the future, makes some conclusions, and uh, this is actually a prophetic dream. So there is nothing uh, 
uh, totally um, false because the person by used the mind, uh, uh, the sleeping mind is making inferences and so predicting. But of course, there are also some, it also refers to some extraordinary dreams that instead are and are still rational in the sense that still they make you make a prediction makes based on uh, um, uh, on reasoning but on the other end uh, these predictions are like the power of uh, this uh, logical inference is based on the inspiration of god which is actually and i really conclude what is presented in the yosef uh, poem that uh, you know that uh, one of the key parts of the story in the uh, in the Genesis and the meeting with Yosef and the Pharaoh is about the famous interpretation of dreams, about dreams that they will eventually occur. And uh, Yosef interprets these dreams and explaining this significance. Now, when Fracastoro, and I really conclude and apologize if... Uh, um, on the one hand, I took maybe a little more time, but also I had to uh, skip some parts. And uh, if you want, we, we can return on these uh, parts that I skipped. Uh, that the interpretation of the dreams by Yosef are actually based on this uh, conception of the scientific theory about the, the, the dream theory. Yosef is inspired by God, and so he can... Uh, foretell this, but uh, there is also the human capacity of uh, reason, and uh, it can use this uh, uh, what is uh, dreamed as a, um, a way to interpret the contents rationally and to anticipate uh, these events because it can make a, a based on the material the material preserved by the dreams. Uh, to to rationally anticipate what what will happen so it's uh, um, you see that the scientific and theological and if we add also that this is communicated through poetry the aesthetical element are strongly connected uh, uh, each other i prefer to stop here and again i apologize for the potential confusions and problems, and uh, I look forward to hear what you think about it. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, just a quick one. Is there any influence or any relation between uh, Parmenides and uh, Fracastoro. I really don't know anything about Fracastoro, so it, it, Parmenides just came uh, to my mind as uh, an important uh, philosopher who who actually uh, disseminated his philosophy through a poem, through a poem, Perifisius. Yes and no. Let's say that uh, let's say that is continuing actually a wider tradition where uh, poetry is a way to communicate science. That you don't have only Parmenides. You have you can find Empedocles. You can find Xenophanes, Lucretius. In the medical content, you have a Nicander of Colophon. So you can mention many people that preceded him and. Uh, and he is actually continuing in this line of uh, tradition. What, what is interesting, in my opinion, and so to say yes, because probably uh, he, is, he was aware of uh, Parmenides and uh, maybe mediated by other sources like Galen, or uh, I, I really don't know, but uh, I don't I haven't met actually uh, strong and relevant references to Parmenides, but it would be interesting to investigate more. Um, what I find, however, interesting about this theory is, is that his, uh, his practice is actually is based on a explicit theory that you don't usually met in these scientific uh, poets. So for Parmenides, for instance, you never hear Parmenides why he wrote in verse. Even Lucretius that uh, uh, refers in the poems of uh, his work, De Rerum Natura, uh, often to his poetry is not that detailed of what is the role of poetry and the relations. So this is something that I find exceptional, this Nigerius, because 
it's a very attempt to also, uh, let's say, uh, summarize and explicit what was already working in this tradition. So, so I thank you for your uh, question and I hope that my answer is not disappointing. It's good.